saints. <laughs> yes, I greet you all in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, yes, and I just want to say what a, what a privilege and what a blessing it is to be able to share the Word of God with you all. Um, yeah, this, um, this place has become my home, and um, it's such a joy to, to be able to preach to family. And um, awesome to have my family here, <laughs> my blood family here. Um, and, and friends, um, yeah, I'm just so blessed to have your support and your love, and um, yeah, I really appreciate you all. <laughs> Um, yes, but as we are getting into it um, this evening, I'd like to start with a, with a quote from A.W. Tozer. And what he says is, what comes into mind, into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. The history of mankind will probably show that no people has ever risen above its religion. A man's spiritual history will positively demonstrate that no religion has ever been greater than its idea of God. Worship is pure or based as the worshiper entertains high or low thoughts of God. And what this means is that how we think about God impacts the way that we worship Him. That our view of God tells us just what we, how, how we will respond to Him and if we will respond to Him. You see, if we view God as this angry tyrants up in heaven that's just waiting for you to to make a mistake to slip up so he can wallop you well then i think you would find it hard to believe that this god could love you and and this is my prayer tonight that as we we get into the sermon that you would you would see god's heart through this passage that you would see god for who he actually is which is love grace and mercy And I pray that you would put aside any idea of an angry, iron-fisted God, but that you would truly see him for who he is. And as such, I've titled my sermon, The Heart of God. And we'll be reading tonight in Luke chapter 15, verses 1 to 10. Um, so that's Luke chapter 15, verses 1 to 10. Um, but I think just before we get into our text, if we can, just um, say another prayer. Um, as I just want to ask God to, to touch our hearts. And so um, if we could bow our heads, yeah. Um, Father God, I just want to come to you, Lord, and I, I just want to praise your name, Lord. And Father God, I just want to ask, Lord, that as, we, that as we get into your word, Lord, that you would open our hearts, Lord. God, that you would reveal yourself to us, Lord, in your word, that we would see you for who you are, Lord. And that we would respond to your majesty, Lord. That we would respond to your, your grace and your mercy. And that we would respond to the love that you have lavished on us. And so, God, I pray that you would be with us throughout the sermon, Lord. And that you would lead and guide us. In your mighty name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. And so, as we read our text um, in Luke 15, verses 1 to 10, we read that now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you have a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls all his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous, righteous persons who do not need to repent. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp? Uh, light, a, sorry about that, light a lamp, sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it. And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of, um, of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. May God bless the reading of his word. And so as we get into our sermon this evening, there's, there's four things that I want to draw out and look at. And the first is the context to the parable. The second is God's heart for the lost. 
And the third is God's redeeming love. And then our fourth point um, with which we'll be closing is how with the rejoicing of heaven. Um, yes. <laughs> yeah. And so as we, as we get into the context to this parable, we see that um, we read as now the tax collectors and sinners all gather around to hear Jesus. And you see, having heard Christ's message of the cost of discipleship, as Red Barry preached last week, the call of Jesus to die to ourselves, to die to the, the, our own desires, but to pick up our cross and follow Jesus, the call to let go of the things that, that we've built up as idols and have put ahead of God, thinking that somehow this might bring us fulfillment. But as Rev pointed out, these things cannot, they can't do it. But it's only as we place God at the, at, as first, at the center, that as we desire after him, that all these other things come into place. That we can love better, that we can do better, and that we can love people better and use them an awful lot less. And so as we correctly orientate our lives to God, we see how these things come together. And so as these tax collectors and sinners heard this call, the call that says, whoever has ears, let them hear. And as they hear that, it's the tax collectors and sinners, the outcasts of society, those that are seen as unclean, that come and gather around Jesus to hear his words. And yet, as that happens, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they scoff and murmur and mutter that this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And as we learned about dinner theology um, a couple of weeks ago, um, two weeks ago, <laughs> yeah, we learned that a, that a meal signifies acceptance, that it means something, that it, it signifies the acceptance of the other person, and it, it's, it's building, forming social and business ties, it, it's forming relationship. And, and so we see that, as, as, as the Pharisee says, yes, they are right, that Jesus does dine with sinners and, and tax collectors. But yet, although that he indeed accepts them, he doesn't accept their sin. That he accepts the sinner but not the sin. And there's always that imperative, that instruction to, to repent and turn back to God. And yet, in another sense, the Pharisees were still right. As they said that Jesus dines with sinners. Because we read just a few chapters back in chapter 14. As we read that Jesus is eating at a Pharisee's house. And so, yes, Jesus ate with, with, with sinners, even Pharisees. Uh, but, you, <laughs> uh, but you see that the Pharisees, self-righteous and self-justified, believing that just as the 99 righteous who do not need to repent, they believe that they, they are in no need of repentance, that they stand above the standard. But as we know, as Paul puts it in Romans 3 verse 10, that there is no one righteous, no, not one. And we read in a chapter later, in chapter 16, as um, Jesus tells the parable of the shrewd manager, um, manager, and at the end of that, he rebukes the Pharisees as, we, as he says, the Pharisees who, you, who, who loved money heard all of this and were sneering at Jesus. And he said to them, you are the ones who justify yourself in the eyes of others. But God knows your hearts. What people value highly is detestable in God's sight. And even this is a loving rebuke. Men who draw them back in repentance. But not only could the Pharisees and the, the teachers of the law not acknowledge their own sin and their own need for repentance, but they could not fathom a God that would seek after sinners. Instead, their idea was that God was one that detests and wants to destroy the wicked. In fact, there was even a rabbinical saying at the time that said, let a man never associate with a wicked person not even for the purpose of bringing him near to the Torah. And so Jesus tells the crowd this parable and revealing God's heart for the lost and revealing to us 
how he feels about those who have strayed. And we read that suppose one of you have a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the, and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? Or suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Does she not light a lamp and sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? And the first thing we notice about these parables is that they escalate in intensity. You see, a, a flock of a hundred sheep was a, was a modest amount. Of course, a wealthy man would own about 300 sheep, but a hundred sheep was a decent amount. And yet not enough for you to be able to lose one and say, that's okay. So it was enough to have to go and search for the sheep. But then we see the woman with her, with her savings, who has only 10 silver coins or 10 drachmas, which is the equivalent of about 10 days worth of labor. And so the loss of one coin is like losing a whole day's worth of, la- uh, of, of wage. And so you can see she can't, it's not something that this woman can afford. And so there's an intensity. This coin is precious. And then we see as we go to the third parable, which is longer, um, which is the parable of the par- prodigal son, which we will see next week. But which now brings the stakes all the way down to two sons. And how precious is a son to a father? And so we see this escalation in intensity as, as, as we see how precious one lost soul is to God. And we, we notice the effort in the search of the shepherd as he searched, leaves the 99 in the fields and goes off and searches the country far and wide looking for this one lost sheep. And we, we see it as the woman lights a lamp in her dark home of not much means as she lights this lamp and searches so carefully, sweeping the floor, straining to find this one lost sheep, the one lost coin. And we see this intensity and effort made in searching for the lost. And as we we read in Isaiah 53 verse 6 that we all like sheep have gone astray. Each one of us have turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And so we see God's heart for each of us. And those of us who are saved, we we can attest how God chased us down and rescued us. We 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 can affirm how God chased our hearts down and brought us to himself in different ways, in different manners, by different means. And if there are are two passages that highlight God's heart for the lost, it's these two. It's Ezekiel 18 verses 23 and Peter 2 verses 3 to 9. And so we read in Ezekiel 18 verse 23. as as, As God says, Do I take any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the sovereign Lord. Rather, am I not pleased when they turn from their ways and live? 2 Peter 3 verse 9 says, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promises, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. And so we can see God's heart for the lost. He does not desire that anyone should perish, that no one should perish, but instead he desires that, that, that everyone should come to him. That they would choose not to die, but instead to turn to him and come to him in repentance and live. And this is the desire of God. And and it's out of this desire that he seeks the lost. And so as we, we see God's heart, that's one of love, compassion, and mercy for the lost. For the sinner, for the backslidden. Not wishing to see them perish, but wanting to see them found in Christ Jesus. And so we see, as we move to God's redeeming love, and as we read that the shepherd finds the lost sheep, and when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home, and then he calls his friends and his neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found this lost sheep. 
And the woman who finds her lost coin, and when she finds it, she calls to her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. And I'll tell you this, as I'll turn to preach the gospel, you see, because we, we live in a broken world, we do. And all you need to do to recognize this is turn on the news, go on TikTok, and we see the violence and chaos that goes on in our world today. And we only need to look at our own lives, at the hurt that we've been caused by someone else's sin and the pain that we've received, but more so, the pain that we've inflicted on others. That we can see that we do indeed live in a broken world. But you see, this isn't the world that God designed. It's not the world that he created. See, the world that God designed was full of love, peace, and unity. Without war, without chaos, but peace and joy. A man had fellowship with God, unbroken fellowship. But then sin entered the, wor- the world as Adam and Eve chose the word of the creature over the creator. And as sin entered the world, it shot our world into chaos. It shot our world into brokenness. And our relationship with God, that was severed, it was broken. And you see, people will try all sorts of things. As we heard last week, people will try all kinds of things to escape this brokenness. They'll try drugs, alcohol, a career, money, a relationship. All these things, trying to escape this brokenness. But all they serve to do is like a a bungee cord. It just shoots us straight back into brokenness. They cannot free us from this brokenness. But you see, God did not want to leave us in this broken state. And so he made another way. And, And we know this other way. As he sends his beloved son, his only son, in whom there was no sin. He knew no sin. He did no sin. And in him was no sin. And yet he went to the cross, flayed, broken, hung out to die a death that we should have died. And as he hung there, taking our sin upon him and the full wrath of God upon his own shoulders. And so, in his death, we see that the work that was finished on the cross. And so Jesus does that so that whoever may believe in him will not perish, but will have everlasting life. And so through this sacrifice, God reconciles us to himself. For all who would believe in Jesus to be reconciled with God, brought back into relationship, brought back into God's original design. And in one of the passages that sums up the gospel so beautifully is 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21, which says that God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. So that we might become the righteousness of God. And what that means is that as Jesus hung on the cross and took our sins, it made it seem as though he had committed every sin that I've committed, that you've committed, all laid on Jesus as though he had committed them. To put it more practically, it was as though Jesus lived my life. And in return, he gives me his life and says that it seems as though I've lived his life. And so as he takes our sin, he gives us and puts on us the righteousness of his self. The righteousness of Christ that is robed around us. And you see, this is the great doctrine of justification. Simple terms, as in, just as though you never sinned. And in so doing, Christ reconciled us to God and restored us as I said, to God's original design, bringing us back into relationship with God. And we read that he did this while we were still sinners. Romans 5 verses 6 to 11. We read that, you see, at just the right time when we were still powerless, 
Christ died for the ungodly. Very, la- very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person some might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrated his own love for us in this way, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. But since now that we have been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if we were God's enemies, for while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. How much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. And so God did not spare his own son. So how far will he go to save the lost? How far will he not go? And I tell you, I had an immense pleasure of being able to go and visit Morabi Prison. As we went as a third year class. And I tell you, it was incredible to see these men's faith. Worship like I've never heard. And as we heard their testimonies, inmates after inmates saying how they thank God for the magistrate that sentenced them. Because it's in prison that they found God, that they found freedom in the Lord Jesus Christ. And even this morning, as as my uncle recently returned from America, tells the story of how while he was in America, they went to go and visit an apartment block. It's an apartment block made by America that, that gives homes to those that can't house themselves and provides them with food. And as they knocked on the door, he knocked on the door of an old lady who had an oxygen mask on. And she said to him, I'm so happy you've come. I've been all alone. And so as he went in and he started to talk to her, she explained how she's got terminal cancer, lung cancer. And so he began to speak to her, asking her, "Do do you have assurance of salvation? Do you know where you're going? Do you know that you have eternal life? And after questioning her about this and her explaining that she she wasn't sure, that he shared the gospel with her, that he shared the gospel with her, and that he said, he said to her at the end as she she said the the Lord's Prayer, the sinner's prayer, and accepted Jesus as her Lord and Savior to spend eternity with him. Then my uncle said that God loved her so much that he sent someone all the way from South Africa to bring her into the kingdom. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And so I ask you again, how far will God not go for one lost soul? And so with that, I would ask that if there's anyone here tonight who is lost, who is backslidden, I implore you, be reconciled to God. Through Jesus, look to him and be saved. Place your faith, place your life in his hands. I'll promise you this, that you are not too far gone. And you have not fallen too far away from his grace. Instead, he is waiting with open arms. If you would just turn to him in repentance, if you would just turn towards him. And then... To my fellow Christians. I would offer you this encouragement and exhortation. And I'll leave you I'll give you this quote as Charles Spurgeon once said, Why should a pardoned sinner live at a distance from his God? Why should a forgiven sinner live at a distance from their God? Don't you see God's grace? And how God desires for you to come to him. And so I implore you, live in relationship with God. Seek him in prayer. Spend time in his presence. 
Devour his word. And then secondly, I would ask you to share his heart for the lost. To share in his heart for those that have gone astray. To seek them out. To share your faith boldly and join in the pursuit for the lost. And I'll say to you that you don't have to join full-time ministry to do this. But instead, in your going, in your surrounding, exactly where God has placed you. To live out your relationship with God. To let your life be a witness before others. Not just in deed, but in the proclamation of the goodness of God. To speak and live out the gospel. And to pray for those who need. To see a downcast co-worker. And to offer a word of encouragement. And to share your faith with those around you. And as we do, as we read the joy of heaven, when just one person repents, one lost person repents. And so we go to the rejoicing of heaven. And we read that just as the friends and neighbors rejoiced at the finding of the sheep and the finding of the coin, in the same way, I tell you that in the same way, there'll be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And I ask you, have you ever given that thought? That on the day that you bent the knee, that you gave your life to Christ, that heaven rejoiced, that they celebrated that you came home. And I'm, I, and I'm sure, as in my case, I'm sure um, with, with many of the others, uh, that there was definitely some angel saying there, like, finally, finally he did it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But still, God rejoices at those who return to him, at those who turn in repentance, how precious they are to him. And so, guys, I hope you see the heart of God. And as, as we see how, how God responds, surely this should fill our hearts with overflowing, with, the, with, with this amazing grace that we, that's been lavished on us. What joy is ours? And my prayer, as we're wrapping up, is that you would not see God as, an, as this angry God that's just out to get you. But instead, I hope that you will see the God, that God is love, that he is patience, that he is joy, mercy, grace, a loving father who would draw you to himself. And my prayer that as you respond to who he is, that as 1 John 4 verses 10 to 11 says, this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us. And sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for us. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we ought to love one another. And so we see that as we have a right understanding of God, how it changes everything, our perspective, our view of others, our view of ourselves, as we can come to accept God's love for us. And then go out and share that love with others. And so as, as we close our eyes in prayer, um, if we could bow our heads in prayer. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, uh, and I would, I would ask now that if there's, there's anyone who would like to give their life to Christ, would like to be reconciled to God, then let there be rejoicing in heaven. I ask you to raise your hand. Let me pray with you. All right. Thank you, Jesus. All right. Father God, we just want to come to you, Lord. And we just want to thank you for, for your amazing ways, Lord. Just want to thank you for your grace, Lord, that you have so lavished on us. Lord, thank you for your son, Lord. 
thank you, Lord, that, that, Lord, that you have made us right in your eyes and that you have given us freedom to come into your presence, Lord, to come into relationship with you, to know you, Lord. And God, I pray, Lord, that, that God, that you would continue to work this in our hearts, Lord, that you would continue to, to, to make our minds and our hearts meditate on what is right and just, Lord, that we would have right thoughts in, about you, Lord, and that our right thoughts would lead to our right worship of you, Lord. And that, God, that as we give ourselves to you, Lord, that you would use it for your glory, Lord, that you would use us to draw more to yourself, Lord, that you would reach through us to those who are lost, Lord, and that we would be a vessel of your good news, Lord. Sure. Father God, we just thank you, Lord, and we praise your name. And Lord, we say that may the, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Amen and amen. <laughs>